In this last episode of our six-part series on vaccines, with support from the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, we're going to talk about vaccine development, both in general and in the context of the current pandemic. We'll walk through the stages of development from basic research to clinical trials, and then we'll compare that to the development of COVID-19 vaccines, with emphasis on how the incredibly accelerated timeline does not translate to compromises on safety. And last, we'll end with some info on the mRNA vaccine approach. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Current cries against the coronavirus vaccine have included calling it the mark of the beast, with some wild claims about it being patented by Bill Gates under the patent number 060606. The makers of these claims might be disappointed to know that they are quite unoriginal, as vaccinations have been proclaimed the mark of the beast as far back as the 1800s. But along with these unlikely claims are the more understandable worries of many people about the safety of the new COVID-19 vaccines. There's a general awareness amongst the public that vaccine development is usually a multi-year process, in large part due to the strict focus on safety. So it makes sense that people might be wary of a vaccine brought to distribution in less than a year. In this episode, we hope to address these worries with straightforward information derived from solid data. We hope that this detailed coverage will help push back against the incredible amount of misinformation that has risen up around the vaccine. Much of it, unfortunately, engineered to play on the fears of reasonable people who just want to feel safe. Let's start with what the timeline for drug development typically looks like and how previous and current coronavirus research fits into that timeline. Vaccine development begins with an exploratory phase full of basic research, meaning scientists at the lab bench working to identify antigens for use with a particular disease. As a reminder, an antigen is a foreign molecule that induces an immune response. This could be a weakened or killed version of a pathogen, or even just a piece of it. The antigen identified for the new coronavirus was the spike protein found on the surface of all coronaviruses. This stage can normally take between two and five years, but we had a huge head start here thanks to research on past coronaviruses like SARS and MERS. Note that we weren't only ahead in terms of basic research on this kind of virus, but also in terms of our knowledge of the mRNA vaccine approach. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. After the exploratory phase comes the preclinical stage. This is where we work to make sure that the antigen we identified is able to provoke an acceptable immune response, and also when we begin to assess safety. We do this by using tools such as cell culture and animal testing. This stage can take a couple of years, but again, we had a head start. Just as we had existing work that identified that spike protein, we also had work at our fingertips that had developed and characterized animal models for necessary testing and work that already laid out vaccine strategies using that infamous spike protein. So long story short, when COVID-19 arrived, years of coronavirus work had already been done that laid a foundation we could quickly repurpose for work with this new variant. In lots of ways, we were able to pass, go, and collect $200, and that is a monopoly reference. After the work of the exploratory and preclinical phases has been completed, clinical studies with human subjects can begin. This clinical stage is separated into three phases. The first phase consists of a small group of subjects, usually less than 100. This is where we start to investigate safety and tolerability, and if we are satisfied with the results, we can move to phase two, which consists of a much larger group that includes individuals with known risks for the disease in question. In this phase, the focus on safety remains and expands to assess whether the vaccine is actually effective at all in humans. And if all goes well, we move to phase three, which is similar to phase two, but in a much larger randomized controlled trial, including thousands to tens of thousands of participants in order to detect potential side effects that might be too rare to detect in smaller groups. The NIH announced that the first participant had been dosed for their phase one COVID-19 vaccine trial in March of 2020 using the mRNA vaccine developed with Moderna. This began just over two months after the genetic sequence of the new coronavirus had been mapped out and shared, which is truly amazing. Moderna's phase two study began almost mid-year of 2020, with the first participants dosed on May 29th. Approximately two months later, on July 27th, the phase three study began. Results from this phase three study were published in December in the New England Journal of Medicine, reporting vaccine efficacy of 94.1%. And of course, Work on several other vaccine candidates have been underway, with a handful already approved for use at this point. Here we've just used one example, 
the Moderna vaccine, to help easily illustrate the real-time progression through clinical phases that occurred. But even now, you're probably thinking, corners had to be cut, right? How else do we condense a multi-year process into less than a year? First, let's go back to where we began with the different phases of development. Because of our previous experience with the SARS and MERS coronaviruses, we already had essential information and data to build upon. That alone saved us years of work. And beyond that, there are three major reasons we could continue moving so quickly. The first is that compared to the last time we encountered a new and dangerous virus, we have more advanced technology. This is evidenced in how swiftly the genetic code of this new virus was mapped out and shared with the world. The second is that the resources in terms of money, mines, and machinery that were immediately dedicated to this effort were both consistent and enormous. And third, the worldwide and pressing nature of this particular emergency inspired the kind of focus that could likely solve any major problem in a shorter amount of time. Typically, there'd be pauses between each development phase. A smaller group of researchers would be working on results and then trying to get funding for the next phase. Companies would have to weigh whether it's worth the financial risk. This time, no risk. The world was willing to foot the bill. Hundreds of millions of dollars seems like a lot to a company to run a trial, but it's peanuts to the U.S. government. Those funds were ready and available at every stage. In fact, so much money was available, as well as a guaranteed population to take the vaccine and the billions, that companies didn't wait for the results of each phase to be reviewed formally before starting the next phase. Why wait? There's no risk of losing money. They even started making vaccine in bulk before final approval was given. So progression from one phase to the next was uncharacteristically rapid, but not because any safety corners were cut. The trials were incredibly robust. Keep in mind the typical effective phase three trials can include just thousands of people, and the Moderna phase three trial included 30,420 people. We should also note that there was a little luck involved. As Dr. O'Brien from the WHO pointed out in our recent interview, some pathogens are easier than others. Some have a vulnerability or an easy target that we can use for the vaccine. And in the case of the new coronavirus, it's that spike protein. Other pathogens have been much harder to target. Take HIV, for example. We've been working on that one for decades and we still don't have a vaccine. And last, we'd like to give a nod to side effects. We recently aired an episode on discussing side effects in context. And while this is incredibly important for any vaccine, it seems especially important now. Mild to moderate symptoms are to be expected when you get a vaccine. These symptoms may include things like fever or muscle and joint pain, and they simply mean the vaccine's working. Those symptoms indicate that your immune system has recognized the antigen in the vaccine and is reacting to it. And in the process, it is learning to recognize and fight off that antigen if it appears again, i.e. if you were to be infected with the actual pathogen in the future. And importantly, more severe side effects must be discussed in context. Like I said, we've done an entire episode on this, but the short of it is that yes, sometimes scary side effects can happen. However, these side effects are one, generally manageable and often far less scary than they are portrayed, and two, should always be weighed against the burden of disease for which the vaccine protects against. The risks associated with contracting COVID-19 are far scarier than the side effects associated with vaccination. Finally, the mRNA vaccine approach has received a considerable amount of attention. The traditional approach to vaccines involves creating viruses or pieces of viruses in the lab, followed by steps like inactivating the whole viruses, purification processes, and so on. The mRNA approach allows us to skip all of that and instead just give our bodies the instructions it needs to create the target antigen. In the case of the COVID-19 vaccine, those instructions are for that coronavirus spike protein we keep talking about. It may help to pause here and explain mRNA. This is a chain of nucleic acids that is produced when enzymes read DNA. You can think of DNA like a blueprint or set of instructions for making proteins. Specific enzymes read the DNA and create mRNA, which then provides those instructions to the machinery necessary to make the protein in question. The M in mRNA stands for messenger. mRNA is very temporary. It gets degraded within minutes to hours of delivering its message, which means that the mRNA in the vaccine has no chance of sticking around permanently in your body. It simply tells your cells how to make the spike protein, and then it's broken down. 
And while there's been a lot of hype about mRNA vaccines being a new technology, years of previous research actually exist that helped us to make quick and effective use of this method. Initial experiments with injecting mRNA highlighted issues with stable and efficient delivery, as well as some harmful side effects like inflammation. However, subsequent work done several years ago led to methods that helped us get around these issues. Other research from years past was able to pinpoint the type of protein designed to appropriately block infection, and other research applied all this knowledge to a potential vaccine for MERS, another coronavirus. All of that together put us in a really good position for creating this type of vaccine for COVID-19. Vaccine distribution is slowly rolling out across the world, but hesitancy is high among a large portion of the population, with side effects and lack of trust in safety being major concerns. We hope that this final episode provides a calm and resource-laden source of information for people to turn to as they try to navigate a landscape full of loud, scary, and contradictory information. Many thanks again to the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation for their support in the production of this six-part series on vaccines and vaccine history. We hope you enjoyed the series as much as we enjoyed researching, writing, and producing it. And thanks for sticking with us. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, you'll enjoy the whole playlist and series on vaccines that we've created. Please go watch all of it. We'd also like if you like the video and subscribe down below so you never miss good content like this. You might also consider going on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help make content like this more available in the future. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chin, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.